Their champion defeated. The Nine can hide no longer. What once was theirs shall now be ours. Nine. It's prolific, epic, fantastic. But is it perfect? And if it's not, then what makes a perfect zombies map? For some fans, it's the atmosphere, while for others, it's all about the easter egg. And then there are those who care solely about the gameplay. And while it's easy to get sucked into the infighting, the truth is, all of these things are important. And it's the balance of these pieces coming together that allow a perfect zombies experience to come alive. But what's weird about this particular question is that it's actually completely flawed. You see, from the very beginning, COD Zombies was never about following any set of rules. In fact, it's always been about breaking them, which is why Treyarch has been so adamant to never settle on one framework for too long. It's why the style, story, and strategy for creating these maps has always been about experimentation. And without it, iconic experiences like Doris and Dorizendrak, well, they probably would have never been created. That being said, it's impossible to maintain a hot streak of innovation for too long before uniformity begins to set in, and the unintended effect of precedent tightens its grip around the community's expectations. And after Black Ops 4 made its debut in late 2018, it was clear that Treyarch had made up their minds regarding Zombie future, with 9 being the primary blueprint. And although this COD Zombies formula has been injected into nearly every experience from 2018 onward, that doesn't mean that it's worn its welcome, nor has any map showcased this framework better than the Black Ops 4 Zombies Darling 9. When most people hear the term settling, they're thinking about settling for less than what they deserve, which of course is sometimes true. But in the case of COD Zombies, or I guess I should specify, round-based zombies, the concept of settling was going to happen eventually. Whenever anyone births an idea into this world, that idea itself is conceived upon a framework, whether we like it or not. So regardless of whatever this idea may be, be it a vehicle, a recipe, or even a type of clothing, over time, while people add or take away things from it, the final form will begin to take shape. And while inside of this structure of zombies, there are lots of little tweaks that we can add here and there to make things more challenging, fun, and interesting, but at the end of the day, the bones of the mode are primarily intact. This is why all of the new major innovations for this mode are coming from things like Outbreak or Modern Warfare Zombies. But those innovations don't build on traditional round-based zombies, they deviate from it, hence them both being different game modes entirely. So when you think about this from the perspective of Treyarch, in 2016, 2017, hot off the heels from Black Ops 3 Zombies, genuinely, I ask you, where were they supposed to go from there? When looking back on 9 from this retrospective framework, it's easy to slip into the comparisons of Blood of the Dead, Classified, and Voyage of Despair in terms of its marketing and launch. But rather than retell the story in the pre-launch and post-launch situation again and again, we're going to focus on the elements that are more specific to 9 in relation to the vision of Black Ops 4 and how 9 introduced the last major set of innovations to the round based framework and just how great of a map it is overall. This substantial shift inside of COD Zombies is evidenced not only by how Black Ops 4 Zombies primarily catered to the chaos story in form and function, but also by how 9 seemed particularly important as it helped to bridge the gap which then justified a lot of these new renovations. That being said, if you have missed the last few episodes of the series, we talk in depth about the launch and marketing and great detail, and there will be a playlist link in the description beneath the like button, and a card should pop up on your screen right about now if you want to give it a watch. All right, let's get back to it. Treyarch knew that there was an immense uphill battle when it came to dealing with community rebellion against BO4 due to their putting aside of the Ether storyline for something else that no one knew about and most evidently no one cared about. This was chaos. The best zombies map of all time, Kino Der Tote and Black Ops 1. All jokes aside, Treyarch knew if they were going to be introducing a new crew that was inevitably going to overshadow their precious 10 year Ether conclusion, they were going to have to go big. And nobody knew this more than Jason himself, which is why he braced for impact and let the community scream at the clouds for a bit before making any major adjustments to the community demand. The thing I say is so much stuff has changed that I'm not going to be listening for a little bit. 
Ooh. I'm going to let everyone settle down, get to know it. In many ways, Nine is an amalgamation of all the greatest hits of what makes a zombies map tick. It touches on all the pillars that have made other zombies maps popular in the past, plus it added in new ideas to help perpetuate that feeling of progress. The layout of the map has that similar feeling to Darice or Gorod Krovi, with a center or main hub and areas that stem from it. The Easter egg was streamlined, difficult yet fair, and it also had a sense of familiarity. The art design was also wonderful and catered to that feeling of mystery that Treyarch is so great at crafting. When it came to new features, things like the challenge system and the interactive crowd were welcome changes, some of which are now staples inside of Cold War, Vanguard, and Modern Warfare Zombies. And what's funny, in present day 2024, is that the new influx of Zombies fans from the Cold War era onward aren't even aware of where these ideas came from, nor are most of them cognizant of the controversy which paved the way. New perk machines, specialist weapons, consumables, and the systems that paired with them, they were superbly designed to fit with the new narrative aesthetic. With the new gameplay changes such as selecting your perk loadout before each game, changing your starting weapon, equipping your specialist from the beginning of the match, and having all of your elixirs on your person rather than utilizing the gobblegum machine which is based on RNG, does any of that sound familiar? <laughs> This new concept of choosing your entire zombies experience inside of the menu versus inside of the map was very new and very intentional. And not only has this system stuck around, but so has the core format in which main quests are designed, as Black Ops 4 helped to standardize our experience by keeping it on rails, ending your match with the game over screen, which we now just call X-Fills. This just goes to show you how important 9 was to the zombie zeitgeist, as Treyarch had their sights set on the chaos storyline and renovating zombies in such a way that we had never seen. And sure, it was tough to deal with at first, but god damn was it exciting. The range of assets that were designed for zombies this time around was unlike anything that we had ever seen before, which is why there was such a push to make everything bigger and badder than anything that came prior. I mean hell, there were even custom bullet weapons that were strictly created for the Chaos storyline time period. And although the levels of hype were off the charts prior to the release, things were taken to an even greater level when one of the most iconic music music videos dropped for this map, showing some of the greatest artistic prowess the Zombies community had ever seen. take a genius to let you know that the art direction for 9 is top tier AAA craftsmanship. From the moment the player loads into the map, you are dumbfounded by the level of immersion that takes place. The fade in from black shows the player that they are behind bars and must walk up a shadowy path towards the bright lights of this presuming gladiatorial death trap. Zombies and undead gladiators begin climbing out of the woodwork to tear you down as you push through each tower one after the next. Players would come to find that every single area inside of this map was dripping with style and felt so distinct from one another that depending on what you were doing or where you were fighting, you would feel a complete mood change simply by being in another room. From the lighting, the decor, and the music, it all impacted one another so greatly you couldn't help but feel overwhelmed by the sheer beauty Treyarch created here. And while there are multiple reasons for this diverse artistic vision, the main one here is due to the lore inside of the Chaos story pertaining to the various gods which set this stage upon this digital canvas we call a zombie's experience. And for the first time ever, at least to this extent, Treyarch was able to adjust their style in a way that superseded their previous catalog. So what do I mean by that? From pretty much World at War through Black Ops 3 Zombies, Treyarch would create a simple lighting and color palette that would be standardized for one experience at a time without much deviation inside of it. Verruckt, Ascension, Mob of the Dead, Shadows of Evil, they all had a unified style. But let's use Shadows of Evil as an example. If I close my eyes and I think about that map, 
map, I see lots of dark brooding reds and oranges with the occasional yellow contrast from the Margo's mouths or the purple hue of the Shadow Man as he stalks you around from district to district. Pretty much every map in BO3 is like this, with only the occasional sections that splinter off into something a bit different. Derizendrak has its Keeper Boss Arena, which is a huge tonal shift comparatively speaking, and if we harken back to Black Ops 2, we can think of Origins the Crazy Place, but even then it's still predominantly subdued grays and blues which connect to the surface lighting in such a way that brings the whole experience together. And whether this was all a deliberate choice due to artistic vision or technological limitations, it seemed that Treyarch was never able to take full advantage of zombies in the way that they wanted. But with 9, this all flipped on its head. Yes, the mentality of zombies has been the spare bits, and we keep that as part of our DNA. The uh, positive side, the plus side to zombies becoming more and more popular, uh, and then hence getting more and more support, we get a bigger team now than we've ever had previously, is um, we now get to spend some more resources on unique assets. So, so Nine is a brand new creation in terms of its space and its aesthetics and all this kind of stuff. But what we try to do is ideas that we have in other parts of the game, we'll then re-theme and bring back in to keep that DNA being part of it. It's nice to kind of keep that mentality, but also now with a bigger budget in terms of having more assets we can kind of request, we can put our own stuff in. And while creating original assets may have been a first for zombies, at least at this scale, I don't think players were ready for just how impactful this would be to the actual gameplay experience overall. Inside the Danu Tower, the cool blues and greens cover the player ever so gently in a dark, dank area as tree trunks are bursting through the ground. The irony here is that this area feels so peaceful and calming, yet it's anything but, as the level of agitation the player feels when they are getting beaten by zombies is a pure adrenaline rush. Ra's tower has a yellow hue that harkens back to the days of Egyptian lore, golden treasure lying across a sarcophagus while sand fills up the chamber's corners, a tight space to train, but it can be done if you're skilled enough. Zeus's tower brings about a bright, clean aesthetic, utilizing ancient Greek architecture to realize this particular vision. Lots of marble and sculptures stand about while beneath your feet, a bathhouse runs with blood instead of water. A sharp turn in atmosphere where orange hues hover around you, bringing chills down our spine as the claustrophobic nature of this area can bring down even the highest skilled player to their knees. And lastly, we have Odin's Tower, showcasing the design of the Vikings and the brutality of their culture, where the Norse mythos runs rampant from top to bottom. But while that might be the last tower inside of this map, the actual main play space inside of 9 is even more impressive, as Treyarch provides two stages for players to slaughter the undead. An open area in the center of the map where sunlight and flames dance around you, and below ground near the Pack-a-Punch where gentle fires attempt to light what is almost complete darkness. Absolutely spectacular. All of these areas are so beautiful and are connected by the chaos storylines, smaller details like mystery boxes and wall weapons which emit a gentle blue glow that always catches is the player's eye. But overall, the lighting and color scheme of 9 were just a peek behind the curtain of what was to come inside of Black Ops 4, as Treyarch had taken their artistic design to heart in such a way that still impacts even their most recent zombies' experiences. And while this art design can appear to be a bit random sometimes, I think this visual segregation is a positive addition to modern zombies as it causes drastic shifts in tonality, intensity, and replayability, as the moment-to-moment -moment action hinges upon not only your literal gameplay experience, but the physical location in which you are playing. But even with all of the great aspects to the artistic visions of Treyarch, none of these ideas would come to fruition if they didn't make sense narratively. So how the hell did we get here and what exactly is going on? Well, I'll let my good friend Mr. Blundell fill you in just in case you are a little rusty with the details. So Nine is a point in the story that our gang, so that's uh, Diego, Shaw, uh, Scarlet and Bruno, uh, are on a quest to discover answers. That's as specific as you're gonna get out of me. Um, and they've found themselves in this cave to which a mysterious voice is, is saying to, to kind of find your answers, you must breathe deeply of these vapors. Uh, they do so and then they appear to have traveled back in time to a different location uh, where some sort of ancient uh, ritual is taking place and they have to fight to survive. Of course, with Blundell, he is never going to give you too much to work with, but luckily I can fill you in the rest of the way. After we battled the Eye of Odin at the end of Voyage of Despair, the Chaos crew managed to figure out the location of an artifact that was presented to them in a vision of sorts. The vision was an archway to the hidden city of Delphi in Greece. The hope is that this city will lead our characters to Alistair Rhodes, Scarlet's father. But in order to get inside of this hidden city, our four main characters have to collect a number of symbols to enter into the archway 
archway, which will translate into a password that can grant them access. When they finally find this archway, they notice a large cauldron and hear a mysterious voice from an oracle that tells them to inhale the vapors of a substance which is sitting inside of that cauldron. And as Jason already alluded to, our characters do inhale this vapor, and then they are transported back in time to this unknown location with the objective of surviving and collecting the final piece of the puzzle in order to enter that archway of Delphi. Shortly after our characters transform into this world, we notice the High Priest of Chaos activating the Sentinel artifact, turning these slaves into zombies, and more or less beginning the trial that they are now forced to complete. And now another aspect to this narrative is the name of the map itself. And well, it's slightly complicated. So back in our Voyage of Despair retrospective, we discussed a bit about this wondrous substance called Prima Materia. This resource was so powerful that it could turn failing societies into flourishing empires and even then some. But through humanity's failings, things would always turn poorly as eventually corruption would ensue. What made Prima Materia so dangerous, aside from human corruption, was that it could be endlessly replicated, allowing for no natural order inside of the world. So after a break in history where Prima Materia became extinct, rather than rid the world of this resource, the smartest and most important men in the world came together and hid the information about it from the world inside of these structures called Sentinel Artifacts. These men were called the Nine. However, their efforts to keep things hidden from humanity are becoming futile as the Order, the Cult, which we see throughout the Chaos storyline, are attempting to access the information hidden inside of the Sentinel Artifacts. And in order to access that information, they have to complete the the trial which is associated with that map's sentinel artifact, aka the main quest. And as we discussed in the last video, Alistair found out about the Order's insane scheme and is attempting to put a stop to it, which is why they had kidnapped him and our crew members are trying to rescue him from potential demise. As we already alluded to a few moments prior, the opening moments of Nine are some of the most powerful bits of gaming in Call of Duty history. Spawning in and being drenched in darkness while making your way out into this large open space, not sure where to turn or where to run, but you know that you have to survive. And in order to power through, we have to solve the map's main quest. While at launch it wasn't exactly clear what players were supposed to do, there was one thing that was inherently obvious and staring us all directly in the face. Each of the gods towering above us, which is exactly how this main quest is solved by appeasing each of the gods, which will allow us to complete the Sentinel Artifacts trial. Nine's main quest happens to be one of my personal favorites as it's super streamlined. It was tough to solve, but it's easy to repeat, and it takes about an hour to complete, which ends with an epic boss battle. Starting things off by opening up the Pack-a-Punch machine, which requires the player to ring several gongs around the map, and collecting the severed heads of your enemies, placing them on four stakes in the pack-a-punch chambers beneath the main arena. Once you place their heads on these stakes, your enemy's blood drains and collects inside of a contraption that breaks the pat machine free for all players to use. It's absolutely horrific, and I am 100% here for it. But as you know, that is just standard Treyarch stuff, as the real quest begins the moment after PAP is opened and you have to find a hidden skull inside of the wall in this PAP arena. And I don't know if you can tell on screen, but the walls are entirely made from skulls. Fortunately, this particular skull isn't too hard to spot as it has markings on it and when the player is up close, they can activate their specialist weapon to knock it loose and collect it on their person. After the skull is collected, we need to place it inside of this grinding mechanism on the underside of the map and shoot it three times with a charge shot from the Wonder Weapon to power the machine to grind the skull into a fine powder. And this skull is only one of three items that we need in order to solve the puzzle for the god Danu. We also need a piece of wood to burn and a pile of feces. That's right, we need shit. Finding the wood piece isn't too tricky as the player just needs to lure a gladiator above ground, having him throw his axe through one of the bonfire structures. This will then knock out a log which you can take and place on a chain above the hot coal inside of the Odin Tower. Now, in order to collect the feces, we need to do something a little unorthodox to how most COD Zombies experiences are handled, and this is by failing to please the crowd. This crowd concept was a new ordeal for Treyarch and was meant to be an interactive system that rewarded the player with various items, and it does work for the most part. If you please the crowd, they give you a good item. But what happens if you anger the crowd? Well, I think you may have figured it out. They throw shit at you. The gauge that determines your relationship with the crowd is called 
Affinity, and it's located just above your health bar for the player to monitor. And the quickest way to piss off the crowd is to run through fire that comes up through those vents. So if the player causes enough self-inflicted fire damage, eventually the crowd will throw poop at them, which is the final ingredient for the special cocktail that we are creating for Danu. After all the ingredients have been collected, the player needs to place them in the bathhouse area of the Zeus Tower inside of a small bowl on the backside of the room. And once these items are mixed in the bowl, the player will have to wait a few rounds before a green musk gently hovers above it, letting the player know that your newly concocted fertilizer is ready for use. Now, nothing about this step is particularly hard to navigate, but for some reason, and maybe I just have shit luck, no pun intended, but I always have a Blightfather spawn in while I am located in the bathhouse, and it just clobbers the ever-living crap out of me, which I probably could have used for fertilizer now that I think about it. But now that we have the fertilizer, it's time to make our way to the lower level of the Danu Tower and place it on the ground beneath the two trees, wait for three rounds until that green musk animation appears again, as it will then be time to kill zombies with the firebomb alternate ammo type over this spot so that it triggers the player's ability to teleport to a black and white version of the Danu Tower. As you enter this alternate reality, you will notice that those Prima Materia boils are on the Danu's tree, and the player must pop them by shooting three boils. Once they do, they will have appeased Danu and are ready to move on to the next challenge. The fires of Danu are sinking. Glory to the contender! The Tower of Ra is by far the most challenging aspect of this easter egg, as the player has to kill specific enemy types in a specific order inside of the tower, which is full of tight spaces and narrowing stairwells. And in order to activate this step, we must find four hidden bull symbols around the map and shoot them with our brazen bull shield, lighting them on fire so that gladiators spawn in the map. The player then must kill these gladiators so that their souls are sacrificed to Ra, and then we can begin the challenge inside of his tower. And like I said, this challenge is pretty tricky, as not only do you have to translate symbols into particular enemy types, but killing these enemies in order can be much more tedious than it initially appears. Hordes of zombies flood the tower, making the player resort to training up and down through the claustrophobic space. The enemies that we need to kill spawn randomly, meaning that the first enemy you need to kill may not appear in the correct order for your advantage. And after you kill the first four enemies, the tower resets and the player has to do this again for a second second time, where generally a Blightfather is likely to spawn, making things even more messy than they were just moments before. First timers will most definitely fail, but as players continue to practice, it is a step that I look forward to as it's super tense and I always feel a wash of relief after it's completed. However, once players do complete the step, you will hear the announcer claim that Ra has been appeased and you are ready to move on. Ra has been appeased. I have a gut feeling here that most of you in the comment section are going to say how the Zeus challenge is your personal favorite as it is super intense and over the top in nearly every single way. And trust me, I understand why most of the community feels this way. After completing Raw, the player will make their way to the center podium inside of the main arena, which will teleport them underground. Hidden in four specific windows are gears that the player can shoot to unlock four lightning rods that will appear in the main battle arena above ground. After unlocking all of the lightning rods, the player needs to acquire a weapon with the Deadwire alternate ammo type to kill enemies inside of the electric area just outside of those lightning rods. Now, pro tip, you can obviously kill regular enemies during this portion of the Easter egg, but if you want to speed things up, you can actually kill two heavy enemies per rod and complete it that way. And once all four rods are connected via electrical energy, the sky changes to a dark overcast and heavy enemies start pouring in from either gate, overwhelming the player in a way that we have never seen before. Zeus! God of Thunder summons his guardians! Now, luckily, the player will have an infinite specialist meter that will allow you to pummel the undead gladiators to death so that you don't have to go down and fail the god of lightning and thunder. What's hilarious about this moment is that it lasts for quite a long time, and the amount of times that it feels like you may die are too numerous to count on one hand. And similar to the raw step, when you finally see that screen flash white and hear that the god has been appeased, there is a sense of relief that can't be replicated by any other game mode. However, we are not out of the woods quite yet. The fire of Zeus has been cleaned. 
The final and last challenge that we have to complete is of course through Odin, the god of war. And in order to complete it, we have to flood the pit grate by filtering water underneath the map. The player must shoot nine symbols with the wonder weapon in such a precise way that the electricity from Sir Ket's kiss is captured inside of the symbols. As this happens, the pipes behind the walls and underneath the floors begin to buckle and break while water starts to flow freely. To allow the water to start filling up inside of the grate, players must head over to the pit where we build the shield, stand on a pressure plate to activate the process, and begin slaughtering the undead. This particular challenge isn't super hard, but it can be overwhelming if you panic. There are essentially three waves of difficulty where enemies gradually become more and more aggressive as you hold down the fort. This eventually ends with a mini Blightfather battle, but once the player succeeds, they can prone on the grate beneath them and pick up a key that has floated to the top of the water pool. Odin! has been appeased. Let the trial's final challenge begin. And it is now time to take this key and enter the ending battle to prove that we are worthy for the Sentinel Artifact's knowledge, and this is of course against Fury and Wrath, the undead elephants. In 2018, when this boss fight was first unveiled to the world, I remember being dumbstruck with how awesome it was. The scale, the intensity, the open space, the announcer and crowd taunting you as you are overwhelmed with all enemies and a giant elephant charging at you from across the map. So badass. At first, when you enter the arena, it's all quiet, leaving the player wondering, what the hell did I just step into? But slowly, the gate opens and the gladiators and tigers start coming in to give you a bit of a warm up, and then when you least expect it, Fury, the first elephant, comes charging out. I give you Fury! As you can see on the screen, these elephants have gladiators strapped to their backs, and they throw spears of Prima Materia at the player trying to damage them just enough before the elephant runs us over so that we are permanently downed. But if we stand strong and shoot the chain links on the side of the elephant, we can destroy the harness keeping the gladiators attached, which will just leave us with the elephant itself. Now that Fury has been exposed, we are able to shoot his weak points which are on his forehead and his side where his heart is exposed from prior decomposition. While this is happening, Fury will stomp the ground and throw the player in the air, as well as shoot Prima Materia around, leaving the player with very little ways to defend themselves, as your shield can only protect you from the elements for so long before it finally breaks. And after Fury is killed, the calm sets in again, and then all of a sudden, Wrath bursts through the other gate, and the process repeats itself. Only this time, Wrath is much more tough and much more aggressive. But in time, the player will defeat both of these elephants, and the crowd will roar with applause as the final cutscene begins to play. <laughs> According to the COD Zombies Wikipedia, after the Chaos crew completes the trial, the High Priest looks over to see a portal appear that shows the word Poseidon, and as he reaches into the portal, he is burned by Prima Materia, but is saved by his mask. And even though Scarlet and the gang completed the trial, the High Priest was still planning to kill them, so Scarlet orders him to grant them clemency via the Novum Ignotum Proclamation, and the High Priest ignores the order and puts them to death anyway. This cutscene is one of the most brutal endings of all time as not only were these characters killed right off the bat, but it was through means of decapitation. And from the perspective of the zombies community in 2018, well, let's just say we had no earthly idea as to what was really going on, but the excitement was electric. Were they actually dead? Was this all a dream? Is this actually the final map and the story is told out of order? The questions were piling up in the community and they were piling up fast. There was so much that could be done with the chaos storyline and it felt like we had barely scratched the surface here. But it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows, trust me, because although there was a lot of hype for this particular cutscene, there were still a lot of problems going on with the community at large, as fans were still angry about in-game optimization, stability on console, and the amount of focus on chaos was still unsatisfying to people who wanted Ether to get the love and attention that it deserved at this 10-year point in time. Now, while the community was still being pulled in multiple directions in terms of how to feel about Black Ops 4 from a technical and narrative standpoint, the area that most people agreed needed work was the gameplay. Personally, I think Black Ops 4 Zombies has aged really well from a gameplay standpoint, but at the time, I was even taken aback by all of these radical changes inside of the mode. And as I stated earlier inside of this retrospective, it seems that these gameplay changes were mostly made for Chaos and 9 was that guinea pig. And this was a tough pill to 
swallow because we had been used to things being a certain way for nearly a decade, and then all of a sudden Treyarch decided to remove Jug, standardize the perk machines for each map, choosing your loadout weapons, a four hit down, an armor system, starting with the most overpowered weapon in the game, and even ending our easter eggs after completion? It was all wacky, especially when playing with our ether crew on Blood of the Dead and Classified. But when porting those mechanics over to 9 in Voyage, things didn't feel nearly as out of place because, let's face it, it worked with this new direction. And for those of you watching who may disagree with me here, just take a look at some of this content in the menus compared to the ether story and tell me that more time wasn't spent on chaos. The specialist weapons will evolve in design as you level them up. The elixirs are all in that Greek mythological aesthetic. All of these little things show where the money and resources were going for the dev team. And Treyarch was setting up a future for zombies where chaos and its mechanics were going to be the bedrock of the mode. And while you could argue that allowing a starting weapon change inside of the ether maps doesn't really have anything to do with asset flipping, you'd be right technically, as the real issue here had to do with an underlying association fallacy. But that doesn't make fans' desire for wanting things to be a certain way incorrect. Anyways, when it comes down to all of these major gameplay changes, 9 shows just how beginner friendly it really is, allowing players to ease into the map with its wide open spaces, simple layout, and clear indicators for where things are and how to approach and unlock them. The gameplay loop is relaxed and allows players to get comfortable quickly by killing zombies, building up your specialist, activating it, acquiring armor, and continuing this process repeatedly, which in turn allows point building, map exploration, and the ability to purchase more resources to survive for longer and longer. In the best and most simplistic way that Treyarch showcased this was introducing a new updated challenge system, and 9 was the first map to show it off. Challenges have been in maps previously like Origins, Zetsubo, Gorod Krovi, and Revelations, but this iteration has become a staple inside of COD Zombies, as it not only appeared in a few maps throughout BO4's life cycle, but was integrated into every single Cold War Zombies map via the Trial Machine. As you would expect, the challenge system provides the player challenges to work through, giving a variety of rewards from new guns, pack-a-punch weapons, perks, power-ups, and everything in between. And Treyarch really wanted us to use this system by not only providing players with basic rewards, but also by giving us tools to build traps, which inside of 9 can be used to build the map's wonder weapon, Death of Orion. Now, there is a lot of contention surrounding this wonder weapon, and I think this primarily stems from the fact that the Death of Orion is kind of like a poor man's wonder waff. Sure, it can do some great things, but for the most part, it doesn't really save you from imminent danger like an Apothecan Servant or a Thunder Gun can. And on the surface, it's a very cool wonder weapon, using the body of a scorpion to shoot its venom in a form of electricity. It also has a charge shot where if you hold it down long enough and then release the shot, it will hold tons of enemies in place for quite a long time, and you can hold any enemy in place, including Blightfathers. But that's really it, as the inconsistency between the power of these two damage outputs is part of the issue. Not to mention, the specialist weapon is going to save more players from trouble than the actual wonder weapon itself, which is clearly problematic, and this is an issue in Black Ops 4 just overall. However, what really makes this wonder weapon unique isn't actually its power, but it's its origin story. And while the narrative of this weapon isn't going to make it suddenly OP, if we have a better understanding of the weapon's quest to build it, why we use it, and why it works the way it does, it actually makes my appreciation level that much greater. So I dug a little deeper into the mythological context of this weapon, and it actually has to do with the constellation of Orion. So check this out. When the world was new, the great hunter and giant Orion was feared by all beasts. He slew many great beasts of the land and sea. None succeeded in staying his arrow. In a fit of arrogance, he proclaimed to the heavens that he would not rest until he succeeded in killing all the wild animals of the earth. His insolence angered Gaia, goddess of the earth and mother of the titans. She sought the help of a lone scorpion and asked him to slay the giant. Initially, Orion was not afraid of the creature. How could one so small ever dare to challenge his might? Yet challenged he was. No matter how hard he tried, Orion could not defeat the scorpion. It dodged his arrows and all shots fired from his bows. Panicked, Orion decided to flee, and that was when the scorpion took its chance. Orion was stung with the scorpion's poisonous tail, and Orion the Great Hunter was himself hunted and slain. Gaia, in eternal gratitude to the scorpion, ensured that his success and Orion's shame would forever be marked for all to see. The image of the scorpion was placed in the night sky with Orion's image next to it. As the stars move, it will always look as though the scorpion is chasing Orion. And that is how we get the name Death of Orion. It is so badass. And the same thing goes for Sirket's kiss. In the art of ancient Egypt, Sirket was depicted as a scorpion, or to have the body of a scorpion, but 
the head of a woman, or as a woman with a scorpion on her head. As many of the venomous creatures of Egypt could prove fatal, Serket was also considered a protector of the dead, particularly being associated with venoms and fluids causing stiffening. She was thus said to be the protector of the tents of embalmers and of the canopic jars associated with the venom. This is absolutely amazing. Treyarch went into great detail to understand this ancient mythology and merge it together in such beautiful and poetic ways. This is why we collect the gift from Serket as the jar spawns in the main arena. This is why we gather the venom from Gaia's tree to poison the mystery box. This is why the venom from the wonder weapon stops our enemies from moving as this is exactly how the mythology tells it. It paints a whole new picture in my mind as to what Treyarch was going for when creating these chaos maps and everything inside of them, especially with the wonder weapons. And although Black Ops 4 introduced a lot of new systems into the game that were throwing a wrench into the traditional COD Zombies formula, players have to give a little bit of credit when it comes to the level of gameplay variety delivered from the devs. In every single map, there was at least one wonder weapon, specialist weapons, guns, melee weapons, traps, a shield, and not to mention the side quest upgrades or fun variations on most of these systems in order for you to experience round-based zombies in fun and interesting ways. And I think the best side quest upgrade inside of 9 would have to be with the map's custom design shield, aka the Brazen Bull. After collecting all three pieces from around the map and building the shield, the player has to then shoot three bull heads on the Zeus Tower with the shield and collect a translucent piece from the ceiling of the Pack-a-Punch area. To collect the final two translucent pieces of the shield, the player has to kill special enemy types with the blade of the Brazen Bull while it's on fire and then can pick up the upgraded shield at the crafting table where it is now called the Iron Bull. The shield is now a bit more durable and deadlier when it comes to taking down zombies, and while this upgrade can be a bit finicky and sort of tedious, it really is a worthwhile upgrade that can be done rather easily inside of every match. 9 is also one of the only maps inside of Black Ops 4 where you can get a couple of free perks. There is one free perk from completing a few challenges at the Challenge Totem, and then another from the Viking side easter egg. This can be completed by gathering three pieces all around the map, a helmet, a sword, and a cup, which can be placed on the Viking's body and the boat, and afterwards, the player is going to head to the Zeus Tower and throw a Wraith Fire across the way and hit a Viking ship, which will create what is known as a Viking Funeral. And after seven rounds pass by, the free perk will appear. And now, I'm not really sure why, but Black Ops 4 is a weird game where it feels like there is so much to do, but also so little to do when compared to a game like Black Ops 3 Zombies. Maybe it's due to the fact that the side easter eggs for the most part aren't super game breaking and are just slight additions to the already stacked arsenal the player spawns in with from the beginning of the match. Because there are two other side easter eggs on this map that I think are often overlooked inside of 9 due to how much effort they require for such little reward. The rock concert easter egg has players shooting heavy enemies outside of the map, getting headshots and shield kills just for some random music during the max ammo rounds. The zero fire damage easter egg requires specific zombie kills with the acid trap and then has players slide under the log trap, which then prevents damage from the fire traps that pop up from the ground in the main arena. But there's a bit of a catch here, as the player has to take damage from the fire traps first at the beginning of every single round. So it's just weird, goofy stuff that was handled kind of strangely. And perhaps the rock concert easter egg could have provided double points every round, and maybe the fire damage easter egg could have just been a bit more difficult to solve, so that we could have zero fire damage for the entire duration of the match without having to damage ourselves every round in order to act it. What's really perplexing about the gameplay inside of Black Ops 4 is that there really is a ton of variety with how you kill zombies, and we have touched upon all those features a few times throughout this video. But unfortunately, since a majority of these systems are baked into the menu rather than into the maps themselves, it makes every experience feel very samey when it comes to the general gameplay and progression, unless there is some sort of objective driving the player to an end goal. So for example, when it comes to general gameplay of just mindlessly shooting zombies, it doesn't really feel much different on Blood of the Dead compared to Voyage of Despair. Sure, the layout of the map and the atmosphere are different, but the overall gameplay loop doesn't differentiate itself too much from map to map. Whereas in Black Ops 1, 2, or 3, there were generally big leaps in how each map felt to the player because the maps themselves offered feature variety as opposed to the menus offering variety as I mentioned a second ago. For example, inside of Black Ops 3, Shadows of Evil had its own unique experience with its own suite of features. As as did Zetsubo, as did Revelations, and even some of these maps had unique guns on them, and back in the BO2 days, maps would have their own special perks to choose from as well. But in BO4, you can pick the exact same loadout and use it on every map, which would lead to a lack of diversity in the gameplay experience. This is why most people use the Helian Salvo to beat bosses or get 
to high rounds because it's the best weapon in the game, and you can choose the same specialists and perks, etc., to give the most streamlined experience across the board. It's like frictionless. It's it's very problematic. However, out of all the maps inside of Black Ops 4, I think 9 has the best case of variety here when it comes to that high round cliche. It still suffers from this issue, don't get me wrong, but if you try hard enough, you can create a different experience for yourself, you just have to want it. By building the acid trap by the raw tower, the player can train zombies from the main battle arena through the raw and Danu towers using all the traps to their advantage, the Helian Salvo, and other tricks, just running in circles until their heart's content. But there is also the underground area that you can train around the map until about round 30 or 40 before shit starts to hit the fan. There is also a window that you can camp by underground as well that's great for farming headshots as no heavy enemies will spawn. And then lastly, there is an area by the GK5 wall by that is great for using mega elixirs and spamming the Helian Salvo and just having a ridiculous fun time getting to high rounds, if you're into that sort of thing, that is. But it isn't all sunshine and rainbows here, as 9 suffers from a weird enemy balance issue where it just spawns so many elemental zombies, brawlers, gladiators, and tigers. It's pretty insane just how much is going on at any given moment, and this can make high rounds feel particularly draining if you're not planning on doing any wacky tricks to try and mix up your gameplay session. And this ultimately leads me back to the main issue I find in most of these BO4 maps, and that is they end up feeling shallow when it comes to that core fun factor of simply killing zombies. Throughout each one of these retrospectives, I have found that when there is an objective to strive for, an easter egg to solve, a challenge to complete, or a boss zombie to kill, the stakes are much higher and my investment is much, much greater. That's why modes like Rush generally fail even on 9 due to the boring nature of killing zombies, which I'm going to be doing anyway if I'm completing an objective, which is much more fun. And hit that like button if you know where I'm going with this, which is why 9's Gauntlet is one of the best experiences inside of Black Ops 4 full stop, offering intense, fun, and interesting challenges capped off with the map's main quest boss fight so that players can get an entirely different experience compared to the main easter egg without having to invest into the learning curve it takes to complete most of these COD Zombies quests. There is a reason that Treyarch finally settled on this formula to become the pinnacle of the COD Zombies round-based experience. That's because it works. From Darice to Kino to Origins and beyond, we have seen bits and pieces from nearly every popular Zombies map injected into the powerhouse that is 9. And this isn't the first time that Treyarch has done this, as Derizendrak is a perfect example of the developers taking Mob of the Dead and Origins to make a magnificent experience that way. And 9 is clearly no exception to this rule, and in fact, it proves it evermore. But I don't think that this is a bad thing. In fact, I think that this is the right way to go. This formula offers a ton of structure for Treyarch to play with when it comes to creating easter egg quests, storyline beats, and many other aspects that we know and love inside of Zombies. 9 also taught the community that these new gameplay mechanics can work when applied on a system that lets them thrive. The problem again lies in the particulars of the situation when you start to add in the neglect towards the Aether storyline, which is why there was such hostility towards the Chaos crew as a whole. But 9 was just the beginning, and in 2018, the Zombies community had many months ahead to decide if they liked this new content offering from Treyarch, and with two maps left to cover in this retrospective series, I wonder if the community will ever come around to the Chaos storyline, or if it will be cast aside, leading to regret.